Okay, so last talk of the day. I know everybody's tired. Uh, try to be focused and to the point and quick as well. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank KGA for inviting us for this uh, magnificent day. I'll be talking about a, a topic that is uh, quite evolving, especially in the last few years. Many things have been new in this topic, okay? Uh, and many things have been understudied as well. Uh, many things are theoretical. So we'll be talking about the field of endohepatology, EUS applications in liver disease. Uh, we'll start uh, initially with uh, speaking about the liver anatomy, uh, the EUS way to look at the liver, and then we'll go into the interventions, uh, mainly how to take a liver biopsy, uh, investigating focal hepatic lesions, the portal vein, gastric varices, ascites, and then some few slides on therapeutic roles of EUS in the liver. So the liver anatomy, it's a bit different than when you see the liver on conventional ultrasound or CT, because here you have to have some imagination. Here you have to put 3D conceptualization into perspective, okay? So as we all know, the liver has eight segments, and to know which segment is which, you need to know the landmarks of the anatomy. Uh, the portal vein branches, you see them on EUS as thick hyperechoic walls. Of course, they are doubled positive. The hepatic vein branches, you see them thin and non-reflective. The bilia radicals, have an irregular course, they are doubler negative, then you see the ligaments, which are more of a hyperechoic structures, there's no lumen in them, and then obviously the landmarks that we all know, the gallbladder and the liver hilum and so on. So what divides those segments is the following. First of all, you have the middle hepatic vein, and this divides the liver into left and right lobes. And then further into the left lobe, you see the falciform ligament and the left hepatic vein. These divide the left lobe into a medial, which is 4A and 4B, as well as lateral segments, which are two and three. And then the right hepatic vein, of course, divides the right hepatic lobe into anterior and posterior segments. And the caudate lobe, which is difficult and hiding, it lies in the posterior compartment between the ligament and venosum and the inferior vena cava. This is a quick demonstration, as we can see, the segments in the right lobe, the segments in the left lobe, and what divides what. So when you do EUS, you have two stations, basically. You have a station from the stomach and a station from the duodenal bulb. The, each station sees different segments, and there's a combination of segments that can be seen with both. So with the stomach, we start in the cardia, and with the duodenum, we're always in the duodenal bulb. So from the stomach, with the scope just below the cardia, as you can see here, okay, uh, you see the IVC and you see the right hepatic vein. And when you're at this point, you can see segment one, segment eight, and part of segment seven. And then with a clockwise rotation, what happens is that you see the ligamentum venosum coming here, and then you push a little bit forward, then you see the uh, middle hepatic vein and you see few of the other segments as well. Uh, and then again, as you push forward, you see uh, other segments until you reach the ligamentum venosum, and at that point you will see the hepatic hilum. So probably you can see 70% of the liver from the stomach just below the cardia pushing down a little bit forward. Okay. Then from the duodenum, you see the right lobe, the whole of it mostly with uh, the segments uh, five, six, seven, eight. Um, the landmark really is the portal venous confluence. When you ever see the, the portal vein, you're safe, you know you're in the, you're seeing the head of the pancreas, and then you can see all the right lobe of the liver. But again, you have to do a lot of counterclockwise rotation in the bulb until the gallbladder is visualized. As we can see here in this uh, demonstration, so the scope here is in the duodenal bulb, you see the gallbladder, and then you can see the right lobe segments as well. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of EUS in the liver? So the transducer can be positioned very closely to the liver, so you avoid any interposing structures. And you can really thoroughly evaluate the left lobe of the liver, hilum, and deep areas such as the caudate, which is difficult to see. However, the limitation exists in the right lobe because it is examined from the duodenum. The area there is very small and narrow, technically difficult, the sonographic window is, uh, is small, and the depth of penetration uh, is limited as well. 
The advantage as well is that we have extra features with this. So we have Doppler ultrasound on it. We can see the blood vessels. We have elastography, so we can see the color coded uh, to see the tissue stiffness, whether this is a hard stiffness or soft uh, stiffness. And this is not limited by ascites or thickened abdominal wall, such as when we do the uh, transabdominal uh, elastography. And we also have the benefit of the contrast enhancement, which helps distinguish vascular rich and hypovascular areas of the target lesions. Okay. So we'll move on to the first application of it, which is liver biopsy. This is the most well-studied application of EUS in uh, liver disease. It is main, mainly or mostly safer than percutaneous uh, counterpart because you can see under direct vision. You can avoid puncturing large vessels. Uh, if there is any abdominal surgical scars, ascites, or abdominal wall thickness, you can perform it much easier than percutaneous route and the specimen adequacy and yield are at least comparable between both techniques. So it is at least as good. There's minor pain, but not as much pain as with the percutaneous route because there is no skin puncture. The benefit as well is that you can see both the left and majority of the right lobe as opposed to the uh, percutaneous route. So you have quick and safe multiple passes from both lobes which give you increased histological uh, variability. And at the same time, you can see any lymph nodes, you can screen for varices. So really the optimal use of it is if you put everything into one container, okay, you do the endoscopy for screening for varices and or dyspepsia evaluation or working out any biliary obstruction. And at the same time, you can take a liver biopsy to diagnose the cause of uh, the liver abnormality. So the technique is usually using the linear endoscope, of course. Uh, we start with the left lobe of the liver to get the proximal stomach, and then we move to the duodenum to get the right lobe. Uh, it's real time, as we mentioned. You can see all the blood vessels and bile ducts and try to avoid them. It requires some moderate to deep sedation. Now, the technique varies. So there's many studies whether to do wet suction or dry suction. Wet suction is when you prime the needle with some saline. Uh, you can put also heparin. Dry suction is uh, just a suction uh, catheter. So studies have shown that wet suction is a little bit better because it, uh, there is no breakdown in the, in the actual uh, fragment. There's no fragmentation. There's also the fanning technique, which is puncturing at different ang angles. And then the depth of the needle pass, which has to be at least three centimeters, preferably seven, but it's not visible all the time. How many passes and acutations? Acutations is how many actual uh, to and fro movement in a single pass in a single area. And then we go on to the needle cho choice, whether we use FNA or FMB. FMBs have proven to be better in terms of tissue acquisition and diagnostic yield. The size 22 versus 19, again 19 has been proven to be better in many studies with, um, uh, uh, with lesser fragmentation and more adequate uh, tissue. And then the type of the needle, whether this is Francine, which is the, the triple uh, uh, puncture site or a fork tip, and there was one study with a direct head-to-head -head comparison and showed that the Francine type or um, shape is better, probably because of the three equal cutting surfaces, so you have a more intact core uh, specimen. And then this is a, a very recent uh, meta-analysis. Uh, last year, I think, uh, with a total of 1,300 patients showed that the diagnostic yield is up to more than 95% with EUS FNB and gives you a total specimen length of around 50 millimeter and complete water tax around 15. This is much more than the required from ASLD. ASLD needs 20 millimeter and 11 CPTs. So it's highly uh, adequate for um, diagnosis. How safe is it? Well, it's safe, pretty safe. There's a little bit of abdominal pain, which is usually mild self-limiting, more with FMB needles. Uh, other thing is bleeding, it's quite rare. It's only up to 1.2 to 2%. And a, a strong point here to remember is that when you throw the needle, you have to really monitor the needle tract if there is any color doubler coming back. Because this, if you just remove it quickly and there's a, a tract there, the bleeding will happen and then you have difficulty controlling it. So the key point is just to put the needle here until the flow has stopped and then you can safely pull it out. Again, the usual considerations of, of platelets have to be more than 50 and INR has to be uh, less than 
We move on to the next application, which is focal liver lesions. Again, EOS has been a uh, great evolution in terms of uh, diagnosis and staging of cancers. So it is superior to CT, especially when lesions are less than one centimeter or located in the left lobe or hilum. You can differentiate them, of course, with tissue sampling or with morphology. A benign one will have a hyperechoic and a distinct geographic shape, whereas a malignant lesion will have a few of the following characteristics. They will be, uh, uh, they will have two components, uh, hyperechoic or isoechoic. Uh, there will be post-acoustic enhancement. Uh, again, there will be some distortion in the adjacent structures, uh, and it has to be at least uh, 10 millimeters. So the larger the size means more of, uh, more of a malignant thing. Elastography is a very valuable tool, as you can see here. The one we're talking about, whether this is hard or soft. Hard is blue. Blue means it is hard, so it is more of a malignant thing or a stiff thing, and this has to be uh, taken into consideration with a, a quite good, reasonable um, diagnostic accuracy, sensitivity and specificity. Uh, contrast enhanced the US as well, gives you a very good picture of what is happening so again, you see the arterial phase, the portal delayed phase, and then you can differentiate whether this is an HCC or a metastatic uh, cancer or a hemangioma or uh, an FNH, focal nodular hyperplasia. We move on now after finishing the liver biopsy and finishing the focal lesions to the portal vein. And portal vein, when, when we as endosonographers see it, we are very happy because you know you're in the right place, you can see marvelous amount of anatomy there and it's easy to find, okay. So, one thing to do with it is to measure the portal pressure. And again, because it is easy to find, it is very attractive. There was a study of about 28 patients where they did the portal pressure graded measurement with a great technical success and no adverse events. However, more studies, multicenter studies are needed to validate such results and Usually, again, in a selection of patients, uh, so those require uh, liver biopsy or various screenings, this can be incorporated in the whole procedure all at the same setting. The way to do it is first you put a 25 gauge needle into the hepatic vein and measure it with a special manometry device. And then you can put it in the portal vein with a umbilical portion of it usually. And then again, with a manometry device, you measure. And then you calculate the difference to get an estimate of the portal pressure gradient. Significantly, uh, significant portal hypertension is if the gradient is more than 10 millimeters of mercury. Another thing to do with the portal vein is to sample it, especially in cancers. You can get a high level of uh, CTCs, uh, circulating tumor cells, and this can give you a prediction of the liver mets in pancreatic cancer or colorectal cancer. This is much better than peripheral blood sampling. You can also FNA uh, portal vein thrombus if you're not sure if this thrombus is really a malignant one or uh, just an original thrombus. And this is much superior to precutaneous biopsy. And several studies have shown that it is safe and sufficient for diagnosis. We move on to a complication of portal uh, hypertension, which is varices. So usually with esophageal varices, you see them as rounded anechoic structures in the mucosal and submucosal layers with a venous waveform doubler. However, regular endoscopy is superior to EUS here because EUS will compress the esophageal wall by the transduders. You may not be seen, seeing the varices um, like uh, in, in a correct way because also they, they are very closely approximated to the esophageal wall, so they may not be within the focal zone of the transduder. However, to overcome this, we can use the water-filled balloon, we can use a more megahertz, a 20 megahertz ultrasound, and so on. However, they are very useful in periesophageal veins and gastric fundal uh, veins as well. So with the gastric varices, uh, it is the way to go to because sometimes you can, it's difficult to differentiate gastric varices from enlarged gastric folds. And what you see may be the tip of the iceberg with a large component being extramural. Again, a big breakthrough is the management of those gastric varices using EUS with coiling. And with the coil, you usually use 19 gauge needles to puncture the uh, actual varics. And then we push the coil with a stylet and we can combine it with uh, glue, uh, usually a reduced amount of glue because they will act synergistically, reduce the risk of uh, embolism and cause more obliteration of the varics. 
this is just a demonstration. So you see the, the varix here, and then you go with the collab doubler, you put your needle in, and you start to push down the coils, and then it's obliterated. Another complication that can be targeted with uh, EUS is ascites. Um, EUS is more sensitive than usual ultrasound or CT, especially for small amounts of ascites. However, in ascites secondary to cirrhosis, the role is limited because you don't want to wait for endoscopy to rule out SPP, and you have to puncture across the, the bowel wall, leading to more contamination. However, the standard of it is really in malignancy-related ascites, where uh, it gives you a beautiful diagnostic information with a great sensitivity, specificity uh, as well, and you can also uh, sample the fluid, you can FNA any omental or peritoneal nodes on the same setting. So again, this is just a quick demonstration here. This is the black is the ascites. This is a mural nodule here of peritoneal deposit, and then you just needle it and take a sample of it. Final few slides are about therapeutic roles of EUS in liver. Most of these are still in animal studies. They are uh, in just case reports and so on, but they're very promising for the future. So hepatic cyst drainage, there's a study about 17 patients where 10 of those cysts were uh, percutaneously uh, drained and lavaged with ethanol versus seven and showed a, a really a great uh, comparison between both in the reduction. However, uh, the recommendation was that uh, EUS would be better for left hepatic cysts and percutaneous approach for right hepatic cysts. Same thing with the abscesses and range of abscesses. Again, uh, great achievement here. But again, it's still in the study phase and it's more preferable in the left lobe. Uh, EUSPD has been greatly uh, advanced now with uh, many techniques and uh, many breakthroughs here. Uh, it's not the time to talk about it, but we'll specifically say some advantages of it. Usually it's an alternative to percutaneous route or surgery when ERCB fails. EUS guided has those the following advantages. You can do it at the same setting when ERCB fails, same endoscopy, same sedation, and so on. You can drain both intrahepatic and extrahepatic bile ducts. You don't need to an extra drain, uh, short hospital stay, and much, much, much less adverse events uh, in comparison to uh, PTBD. And then the last slide will be about uh, liver tumor ablation and injection. Again, there are val uh, variable uh, techniques, whether injecting alcohol, radiofrequency ablation, photodynamic therapy, cryo, injecting chemotherapy into the portal vein as well. Uh, but again, we go back to say that there is a need for larger prospective studies to analyze the safety and efficacy of these techniques, although they are really very promising in this field. And by this slide, I end our presentation. I hope I didn't uh, keep you for long. Uh, I went as fast as I can. Uh, hopefully, we achieved what we were aiming for. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, <coughs> Dr. Faisal. Thank you so much for this very interesting uh, talk. So, me as a pathologist, uh, 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 Actually, my, my colleagues and friends, Ali Al Ali and Ahmed Hashim, taught me a lot about US and hematology, and they gave me a great help uh, while I was practicing here. But when I went back home to Egypt, the issue is uh, the cost. You know, it's, uh, for example, if I want to do a biopsy of the liver, uh, vercutaneous is much cheaper than uh, US. So, do you think the benefit still can, uh, can weigh out the cost? Uh, I mean, should I insist of using US uh, uh, over the be continuous or here it, it will be a, a ratio, an issue of cost benefit. Yeah, so, so you have a greatly valid point. Uh, I think that the best use of it, as, as I mentioned just maybe a slight subtly, is that when you are in, in a setting where you're doing esophageal varices screening or banding or you're checking for anything else, at the same time you can do the, uh, the biopsy. This will be the best utilization. So we can do few things in one setting, but if, if the patient is just for liver biopsy, well, you can argue about cost at this time. Um, again, maybe save it for people who have contraindications to percutaneous liver biopsy, or it's difficult to get a percutaneous liver biopsy on them. But I think the best use of it is if you have few, uh, more than one indication, and then at the same setting, you will do the liver biopsy, uh, US guided.